Hello, and welcome to your wake up call. My name is Mark Cron, and I'm coming to you from beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia. As always, it's a pleasure to be part of the PMC global community, PSSM community. I'm always grateful for the opportunity to share some things I'm passionate about with with their community members and, you know, with any with any bit of, I don't know what, I don't like to call it luck because that's laboring under correct knowledge. But, you know, the, the goal is that people get, that you can get something out of what we talk about that can wake us up so that we could have a better everyday life for ourselves and share that so that the people around us can have a better everyday life too. Mm -hmm. So today on your wake up call, I have two great guests who I'm happy to mm -hmm. call friends. And our topic mm -hmm. is reviving the language of the land, food as medicine. And our guest today is Casey McFarland and Lori Schneider. Mm -hmm. Now, Lori's a herbalist, all around great medicine woman. When she takes a look at, uh, you know, just indigenous natural plants and their healing abilities and, and how we can use them. And Casey, honestly, Casey, I just think you're an awesome young woman who's just out there sharing your gifts. I know you love organic foods, you make all sorts of decent things, you're into plant medicines. I don't even know what, a, if I had a label for you, I wouldn't know what that is. But maybe you can <laughs> tell us um, a little bit about yourself and your passion and what it is that you're you're doing now, because I know you've got a podcast, Consciousness Continuum, sharing your, your passion with the world. Tell us a little more. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, ever since I was a young age, I've been very interested in food. And I was quite interested in the way that our body reacts to real food and how how abundant it is and how how normal it is for us all to have real food and medicine. So I've just been kind of, I guess, feeling a bit called by the plants, not so much just uh, entheogenic plants, but also uh, just food that we eat and how it's kind of a great time right now to be talking about that and not so much giving people pamphlets, but just providing inspiration to spark conversations about how important it is and free it can be to have food and medicine for everyone. So mm. yeah, it's a little gist of who I am. Yeah. I like what you say about free because, you know, we can grow so much in such a little space. And Lori, I know you're an expert about that. Uh, you've been on, on your wake up call once before. We had a great conversation a few months back. Um, maybe you can tell those who are watching, um, you know, a little bit about yourself and what it is you do exactly. Um, and then we'll get rolling on this con great conversation. Great, thank you, Mark. And good to see you, Casey. And um, well, I guess what I would just share a little bit about myself is that I have a real love of plants and of the land and our ecosystem, our living world. And so I am I feel really honored and blessed that I get to go and teach to children of all ages, starting sometimes as young as three years old, about our wild plants, our native plants, and even medicinal plants, so how we might use them and incorporate them into our lives and not only for us but the importance that they bring for our pollinators our insects you know and all the other creatures that i feel we have a responsibility to ensure that they're living with us so we can witness them as they are witnessing us and for our future generations you know for our children's children so mm -hmm. um yeah, so, you know, I teach you about gardening, you know, permaculture, a little bit of herbalism. We also, I've been um, reaching out to talk to um, people about cannabis, you know, what's their perception around cannabis, you know. Just again, I think our whole, um, we get imprinted. So we have to question everything that we're learning and we, you know, have to ask those questions. Is this true for me? And how does that make me feel when I eat those wild greens like dandelion or have those experiences and how does it open me up? Beautifully said. So much there I just want to touch on. And right. <laughs> one of them, one of them <clears throat> excuse me, would it not be to be fair to say that all plants are medicine? Absolutely. Right? Like even broccoli is its own medicine, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? 
As and, long as you eat it within three days. You have to eat broccoli within three days of it being harvested. Otherwise, it has no nutritional value. Oh, really? Well, I know. This. How interesting is that? So here's what... <laughs> That, that's just a great segue to just get into what comes up for, for me anyways. Let's talk about the nutritional value of our food when we buy it from a supermarket, when we buy organic food, and then the difference of when we grow it on our own. Like three days on broccoli, come on. How, how are you going to get three-day-old broccoli mm -hmm. in any city or commercial mm -hmm. uh, food outlet, really? Right? Well, you can get it from your farmer if he's just harvested the day before and then you've got to make a commitment to eat it right away. And of course, the best is if you grow it yourself, mm. right? And then you then you know exactly the age and the end you're going to notice the flavor is different. Your energy is going to feel better. You're yeah, you're all of a sudden you're like, what what am I on? You're on mm. you're on life. You're eating life. That's what you're eating, right? something that is that alive. Yeah, so how much nutritional value is in the food that we're actually buying from the supermarket? And then is there a difference in organic? Is it, Or is that just some people think that that's just a marketing fallacy? Do you want to say something there, Casey, to that? Any thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, I feel like I feel like a lot of the food that's in the grocery store, like it's come over on an airplane from Mexico, like tomatoes, for example, that we could just grow here. And it feels to me like the spirit is quite important. Like if we grow it in our own backyard, we're also getting nutrients from the life force that's that's grown in those vegetables and fruits. Do you think that's important, Lori, um, for the life force to be in, in the foods that we eat? Absolutely. You know, we have to remember we're vibration, right? We're energy, we're pure, you know, light and and energy. So we really need to support that, our, you know, our own vitality. And, you know, one of the things is, you know, that question mark, you know, around organics, we have conventional, you have organics, you have biodynamic, which is actually the Cadillac mm. or the gold of any foods if you're going to be growing because you're looking at growing your food, making sure that the soil is strong and healthy, right? So everything's really based on that. And in the organic certification, there are some organic herbicides and pesticides and such. So, you know, there still can be some sprays there. And, and of course, what, what I love to share is that our wild plants, our beautiful wild weeds, you know, dandelion, purslane, uh, plantain, um, amaranth, all pig's weed, all kinds of beautiful wild plants probably are one of the best for us because um, a lot of their root systems go deep into the earth. Alfalfa, for example, goes 125 feet into the earth. What? Uh, yeah, and your dandelion's going about a meter down. So it's having the ability to pull out all that calcium and iron and beta carotenes and all these beautiful minerals that we're not getting in most of our conventional food or even organic foods just because it's not always uh, about caretaking that soil the way that somebody with a biodynamic training would, would have. So, you know, get to know your weeds that are growing in your garden or beside your garden. And instead of pulling them out, you know, learn how to cook with them, learn to put them in apple cider vinegars to extract out the minerals. Um, you know, uh, dandelion in this, I got this one from Bridget Mars, bless her for that, because she's a big proponent on, on the dandelion. And she said the dandelion stems make beautiful pasta noodles. Wow. Wow. <clears throat> well, and that's what I think is so interesting. It's something that has so much nutritional value. We just started treating as a weed. Mm -hmm. right? well, it's kind of like a commodity in terms of um, uh, the war on weeds, right? Is to, um, uh, you know, buy all those pesticides and herbicides and try and get rid of the dandelion that has been growing with us, our ancestors, since probably time memorial and that have you know been feasting on this incredible beautiful wonderful tasting and again part of it is a education 
because it does have a bitter component, which is really important for your digestive health. So if you've got any digestive health, uh, you know, challenges in your GI tract, like constipation, diarrhea, flatulence, um, you know, tummy aches, uh, you know, just really having a, a hard time and, and, you know, with your digestion, then what you need are more bitters. Mm. So we get the gallbladder producing the bile, right? We get the spleen releasing the enzymes. So when we start to understand the body system and that all these different organs need um, different plants because they have an affinity, because they're talking to each other, communicating and supporting um, digestion, then wow, our, again, our vitality goes up because we're not feeling sluggish all the time, right? Trying to you know, pull ourselves up taking some kind of you know stimulus like a caffeine and um and being able to yeah understand this beautiful wisdom of our body and what does she need or he need right what do we need mm -hmm. it seems like a lot of our issues that we deem as extravagant could be cured through our our food and just knowing what's around mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And that's that's really awesome that you teach children that because um, yeah, they're kind of the basis of what's to come. So the more inspired, open-minded, independent mm -hmm. individuals we have, the better, I think. Mm. Well, yeah. Well, and you know, we're being imprinted, right? Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we really want to help those children. And, you know, recently in the summer, I was doing some um, uh, outdoor education. And one of the little boys, who's about four, he looked at me right in my eyes and said, I like you. Oh. And when he said that, you know, what I, I really got from that comment to me was he was so grateful someone was showing him his living world was giving him names, some understanding, some stories, and that he actually now has the ability to go outside and find some food. Mm. Although I, I do tell the kids, don't eat the wild greens without an adult, right? So <laughs> empowerment right. for him, right? Yeah, well, imagine if we actually had that part of our mm. education curriculum, you know, mm. and mm -hmm. Lori, had this conversation before and I think Casey we've talked about it you know imagine if instead of having lawns we had gardens mm. you know we took care of our garden in the same way we took care of our yard to look all colonial and all pretty and stuff right and and then you start swapping with your neighbors you know even create the community so people grow different things so you have a wide range of, of you know fresh produce that's grown locally and you know, I, I just find it always interesting that, um, you know, our education system hasn't changed much in, you know, decades. And I mean, like decades and decades and decades and decades and decades. And we've learned so much about the world, about health, about nutrition, yet we're not fully teaching that, even in what we see in the world today with, with COVID, you know, we talk about the system and the naturopaths and all these doctors nobody can talk about taking care of the immune system without getting censored which to me is just you know that's where we got to wake up to you know a logical commonsensical approach and you know deductive reasoning that hang on a second if i'm healthy you know it's going to ward off almost anything is that again fair to say because I, I know sickness and disease can come from here too right yeah we are emotional we're mental we're spiritual we're physical and um and i i think health is all completely tied up in all of those systems there mark and of course you know the the you know having fresh air having mm. clean water is vital for the planet Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know, according to some of the, you know, uh, conversations that I was listening to at the beginning of COVID, um, one of the doctors talked about that, the, that um, these viruses come into play in very toxic environments. Mm -hmm. 
So when, when we can't see the sky, we can't see the sun every day, which many people are living under that type of, if I could even say the word regime, really. You can um, say whatever word you like. Yeah, is that it, 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 it breeds um, uh, disharmony, right? Unbalanced. You know, the environment has got to be clean. And, you know, it's one of the things I was just teaching some Boy Scouts last night. And at the very end, I was just saying to them that for me, my home is not just Vancouver. The whole planet is my home. So I, I want this for everyone. I want this for all species to be living strong, long, healthy lives. Because that's what we have. That's our human right. That's the, you know, that's the law of nature or the rights of nature as I was thinking about the other day, what, you know, our rights are to have that. So, you know, keep your body strong and healthy, have lots of vitamin C, know your antivirals, all your culinary herbs, your rosemary, lavender, thyme, sage, peppermint, they're all antivirals. So, you know, cook as fresh as you can and, you know, make some beautiful teas or infuse them in honeys. You know, honey is also a, a really beautiful medicine. Just make sure, you know, it's coming from a farmer, a bee farmer, who's not using insecticides. Otherwise, it's in your honey and your and your um, your salves. Yes, and not just the insecticides and everything else. Did you know? I saw this documentary on the, you know, it's like the honey conspiracy. And there's a lot of honey that is sold and bought out there that is not really honey. It's a little bit of honey and the rest they throw in corn syrup and fillers and all sorts of stuff to cheapen it and they flavor it and then they call it honey. Oh, dear. Yeah, yeah, it was, a, it was on Netflix. I can't remember what it was called, but it, it blew my mind. Same as like avocados and what goes on down with cartels and the value of avocados. You know, and, and this leads me into something else that I wanted to share. But before I do that, I just want to reach out to anybody who may be watching right now. If you have any comments or questions or anything like that, please feel free to put them in the comment section. We can see them and, and I'd love to answer your questions and maybe, you know, have some dialogue with, with our guests, Casey and Lori, as well in regards to anything you may want to know about, you know, natural plants, herbs, and, and all of that sort of stuff. So now, you know, we talk about the commercialization, you know, and part of it is for survival to feed the, you know, billions of people we have on this planet. But I'd watched this documentary, um, which was a lead into the Vancouver International Film Festival has a catalyst program for uh, young and upcoming um, filmmakers. And this guy went down when he heard about this palm oil thing. And who would have known that palm oil is almost in almost everything that we buy as a packaged good, which I thought was interesting. And the devastation that's happening in Indonesia mm -hmm. and what they're doing there, like, you know, you were talking about smoke and things. Every year they're burning off these bog lands so that they can grow um, these palm plantations. And, you know, the half, 50% of the island of Borneo, gone, all the palm plantations, the island of Sumatra, 50% of that, if not more, all gone. And to see how it impacts the lives of everybody in that area, like the smoke was crazy and, and they called it the haze, you know, and it's just, it's really interesting to see that how brilliant we are in humanity, we can be so, uh, devastating and catastrophic in the way that we treat the planet. You know, mm -hmm. so I'm curious your thoughts on that. And, and then how can we negate that as, as individuals, as community? What do we do to, you know? Well, I'm kind of curious, like, when did all of this start happening? Because I don't think way back in the day we were using things so extravagantly. Like, we weren't extracting every last resource and stuff whatnot so we used to be able to provide our needs from the people around us mm. for the most part i think and then we traded and whatnot so i almost feel like it has to go back to that in a sense and use the technology we have not to destroy nature but to to assist her and to work symbiotically with her rather than cause catastrophes mm. well we commodified our food 
this is what happened. When it, instead of it being the commons, it's now commodified. Mm -hmm. And again, we everybody wants things cheap. We became, you know, a society based on throw away. It's fast, easy, throw it away. And you know, that's why the slow food movement happened in Italy in 1988 when um, McDonald's was first coming into, into Rome. And um, they were just like, wow, what's going on? We're all about slow food. You know, we're all, you know, we, we grow it, we have beautiful dinners, we have long, long dinners. So when we commodified and, and moved into having a faster pace, Casey, this is when everything started to really change. The other thing is um, the, the, um, the corporations are collecting all our data. And so instead of the supermarket, you know, most times when you have a market, you're selling based on what your consumer is looking for. But what's happening in the marketplace around food, we're being actually told this is what you get offered. So we're not actually, you know, um, we're, we're not moving that market by what we're asking for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's something I'd been thinking about recently because I had to really change my diet based on going through menopause and with my hormones changing and my system just kind of being out of whack for whatever reason, I get this really itchy skin if I eat foods that are very heating in my body. And, and this also kind of relates to um, Indian medicine, Ayurvedic medicine um, in my dosha. So anyway, so I'm a little out of balance there and I've had to really clean up my diet. So no meat, no chicken, you know, no nightshades, no wheat, no sugar, which, you know, if we really think about it, sugar is what I've now labeled as a colonized food. It also has a terrible history. So the more we get off the sugar and we start reading the ingredients, like you, you know, you said, Mark, it's in everything, then we can start to make a shift. So I started thinking, wouldn't it be interesting if we did a challenge? Just for one month, you started yeah. eating more vegetables because that's all I, mostly I eat is vegetables, a little bit of egg and, um, you know, and lots of fruit. Well, one thing I will say is Patrizzi, who's, you know, the pyramid master of India, one of my gurus who gave me my spiritual name, PMC, PSSM, we're all about a plant-based diet. Mm. You know, we're not about killing the animals, the fish, the bird, any of them, right? Because we believe all life matters. And, you know, so when we talk about a plant-based diet, we're talking to the right people. Mm. Yeah. So what my question would be after a month, Ask yourself, how do you feel? Because, you know, we have so much tied up in our emotionally around our food, right? Hence why it's so hard to get off carbohydrates or get off sugars. Um, so what we want to do is start to ask that question. How do I feel after this meal? How do I feel after this meal? It's kind of like a little tag song there. And um, then after a month, if you're really feeling good, maybe your pocketbook, you actually have more money in your pocket, you know, then do it for six months. What would happen is on the whole planet, there would be more demand for vegetables. Mm -hmm. We would actually start to change the way we're farming through the prairies in the Midwest, which is having a huge impact on the All that nitrogen is flowing into our streams and into our rivers, going into the ocean, where we've actually created over 700 dead spots in the oceans. And Casey, wow. back in the 1960s, we probably had about 40 dead spots. So, oh, man. you know, we're, we're the ones that can affect the change when we make um, other decisions here. Yeah, and and we I, I noticed that Mark and Casey have kind of gone off, and, and I think we might still be recording. So I'm just going to keep talking here for a few more minutes and hopefully everybody catches up here. And, you know, Mark mentioned orangutans in uh, Borneo. Well, he didn't actually mention the orangutans. I'm mentioning the orangutans. And, and they were mentioned. They were mentioned. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and there's a beautiful project called the orangutan project. And I'm just trying to remember this gentleman's name. I bought his book. I met him once. He came into Vancouver and I was 
fascinated in the work that they're doing. And I found this really interesting. Orangutans are very similar to us in their DNA. I think it's 96%. But what's beautiful about orangutans, they're altruistic. So they don't actually hurt another insect. They don't hurt any other species, even though they could do major damage. They don't actually hurt anyone. What's interesting about chimpanzees, which were about 98% the same, they are actually a warring species, right? So you can see sometimes we have these choices. Do we want to be on that warring end or do we want to be in the more altruistic? And I think that probably has a lot to do with a plant-based diet because chimp chimpanzees actually eat meat. I don't know, mm. something to think about. Yeah, it, it, it is certainly something to think about. And it's interesting you talked about orangutans because in the, uh, the second half of this documentary, it was called um, about the, the looser. It was the final cut of looser. And looser is that area in Sumatra where, you know, over 50% has been in, converted and, and made into, you know, palm farms basically and plantations. But they've got the Looser is the home to the last 7,500 Sumatran orangutans, 2,500 Sumatra elephants, 400 tigers, and 80 rhinos. And it is one of the most diverse habitats going where these animals are all living together in their natural habitat. And this has all been getting smaller and smaller and smaller, which is, you know, kind of goes hand in hand with what you're saying in terms of how we're, you know, the animals, we can learn from the animals, we can learn from the plants and see what's happening. And eventually, if we keep squeezing everybody out, the balance of nature goes out of balance too, right? Yeah, we're, um, we've, um, we're not paying attention. And, you know, I, I think that's why, you know, in some of the prophecies, they're talking about, you know, indigenous ways of knowing how important that is, you know, for us. And, and what I remind people all the time is that we're all indigenous to the earth, right? We've been colonized away from that indigeneity. And, and if we go back outside and, you know, that's the, the blessing for me in the COVID is I have never seen so many people outside in Vancouver, which is really one of the most stunning um, cities in, on the planet, as far as the city goes, uh, outside every night, families out, young people, um, at the way we should be outside. What a bunch of all. rebels in today's day and age, these Vancouverites say, eh? my goodness. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess I, I know some uh, of our numbers with the with the COVIDs are going up, but you know, I, I think that's gonna be expected on some level. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, we'll, we'll fare okay. I think we'll do okay. Absolutely. And we just keep remembering, wash your hands, you know, in the moment, just have a little physical distancing. I, I wash my hands with know. the dirt outside. With the now, dirt, yeah. With the dirt outside. Now, some, you, you mentioned something about sugar that I wanted to touch on because I think this is a wake-up call that everybody needs to be aware of sugar. If you don't already know, because not everybody knows this, but sugar, I got a friend at one of my first interviews I ever did a few years ago. Sherry Strong, she's a local Vancouver woman who's all about sugar. And what I learned from her was that she called it, anytime you take something out of the plant world and make it go from green and make it white, it's a drug, right? So sugar, she would refer to as a drug. And the science has shown that the sugar lights up the opiate receptors and all these addictive properties in the brain, and we become addicted to it. And the amount of sugar that we are consuming just as a nation is incredible. And I wanted to further go on to say is like when I gave up sugar, when I gave up meat, when I started changing my whole lifestyle a number of years ago, it was amazing to see, well, it wasn't seeing because it was feeling how I felt, right? The energy, the clarity, I thought different. I felt different. I had more energy. It was a night and day difference. And when you say, pay attention to how, you know, how did this male meal make me feel? That should be a hashtag, by the way, Lori. <laughs> hashtag for your challenge. Um, as soon as I eat something that is not 
good for me compared to, you know, being eating pretty clean. It's amazing how quickly you feel not good. Well, you know, I, I, one of the schools that I've been teaching at keeps asking me year after year to come back. And they were like, what else can you teach us? Right. So we did um, some workshops around healthy drinks, right? So how much sugar is in Coca-Cola and your juices and even in your milk, how much sugar is in the milk? And um, what I discovered as I was getting myself prepared is that the sugar actually goes through the same pathway as if you just drank alcohol in your liver. So the liver looks at it exactly the same way. And I found that really fascinating. Um, you know, it, I think some of our biggest challenges is, you know, we can do lots of education and we can give information and hopefully empower. But at the end of the day, it's always about our own personal choices. And that's why I'm saying, you know, ask that question, how do I feel after I've eaten something? You know, maybe it took you up and, you know, gave you lots of energy, but then you really crashed afterwards. Mm. Um, the other is, um, yeah, how do we really help and support each other to, to create better habits for ourselves, right? But also for the planet, because it's these habits that are actually being incredibly detrimental to our living world. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like change wouldn't it doesn't need to take that long like like you say it's just our habits that we form mm -hmm. so if if it could become the new fad like the new trend mm -hmm. you know to feel good and to lift people up instead of compete all the time and like yeah it could be very very interesting to see what played out and and that's going to take a, a really huge shift in a collective consciousness right and and that's really the mission of everything I'm doing. And, you know, why we're even here this evening is to inspire people to do something different that has the opportunity to possibly enhance their life, their energy, their body, their health, you know, their spirit. And I think it's really important to keep having these conversations because at some point we're going to reach that critical mass we have to you know the mother nature is going to take care of she's going to take care of it if we don't right mm -hmm. and, simple. and that's going to be with you know natural disaster and things that, that are going to happen that she's going to have to do it she has to do to balance out you know the natural ecosystems of the world especially as we keep destroying them and we see it happening all over the world all for commercial interests, industrial farming, and all of those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. It seems like we don't so much have to come up with these great answers to life's problems, but just to not put a, a spoke in the wheel, you know, if, mm -hmm. if we're going to be harvesting everything and acting like children, then we were probably going to get a lot of natural disasters and we're not going to feel satisfied or connected or anything. So we just we just have to listen and we have to look after our well-being and care about the planet because it's really the sustenance for our existence yeah i, I agree and Lori, i just wanted to say because i think you said uh used the word a few times in the beginning about being we've been imprinted mm. right you know we have been taught and learned and these things have been ingrained into us mm -hmm. where you know, if you don't know any different, you know, you can go through life with your blinders on until all of a sudden, you know, there's an awakening. Something happens that we realize that there's, you know, more truth out there than maybe what we've been told, even if what we've been told is the truth. And I find it interesting that even in today's world, the misinformation of some of these brilliant, brilliant people really put society at odds against each other when we need to be coming closer together and working closer together there seems to be this divide happening now i don't know if either one of you um you know have given that thought of how we can you know bridge these gaps in a healthy sane loving caring um 
even if I dare say spiritual way, what would that look like? How would we do that? Well, can it, it Mark, um, I don't know if you've had a chance or anyone else out there has um, picked up this new program that's just come out on Netflix called The Social Dilemma. Oh yeah. It's all around the social media. And so, you know, now we have a better understanding that on an unconscious level, how we're being uh, maneuvered that would be a gentler word than the other word that I, I could also say. The other is to recognize that once we hit 1% of mass consciousness in us thinking, um, not thinking, but rebonding or bonding, because I don't even think some of us were actually first bonded with our mother, which is the earth. And, you know, I, I just did a plant walk on Sunday and one of the women that, that came out on the walk. She's come to a couple of my workshops and she's from originally from Shanghai. So one, she was commenting how she feels more connected to this land here in Vancouver because now she knows some of the plants. The mm -hmm. other, she recognized she, because she grew up in a city, she never had a bonding to the land or to the earth because she's in a city setting. So I found that really, really interesting. So this, um, you know, uh, a way of how we bond with our mother so that we um, start to change our relationship, recognize our responsibility, foster respect, and also start these practices of reciprocity where we take care of what's taking care of us. And this is what I've noticed with people gardening in Vancouver, and I'm sure this is help, you know, happening worldwide, is again, how does it make you feel? Wow, hands in the soil, right? Growing carrots and lettuce, tomatoes, cucumbers, and sharing them out in the community, how that grows us, right? Mm -hmm that's going to release those dopamine receptors and serotonin and all that other good feeling when we actually um, take care of each other. So you can see, I, I think really it's so simple as just getting outside, as, you know, uh, moving our bodies. There's something else that's so important for our physicality mm -hmm. and, um, you know, putting our hands in the earth or even making things. Right, Casey, you know, my, my, my hope is that we're actually moving into a new paradigm in, in terms of handmade life, you know, spending more time in nature, playing. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. You guys, the other Netflix movie, I must, and I'm so grateful for my girlfriend, Lydia, for, you know, um, hooking me in is the, my uh, octopus teacher. Mm -hmm. and, and I will tell you just one scene it, it, it's the octopus is playing with the fish. And this is the thing that's really been my whole theme with this COVID is to recognize I need more balance in my life where I'm playing. Mm -hmm. I'd like to be playing about as much as I'm working. So I want it to be almost 50-50. Well, what if your work was your play? What if we change that <laughs> word up? Because work is a four letter word that ends yeah. in K. Yeah. Is <laughs> Lori? I know you, your work is doing what you love. Yes. So wouldn't that be playing? Yes, it is. You know, you yes. imagine imagine the pattern interrupt if you're heading out and you go, "Oh, I gotta go to play." And you go, yeah, "Play? Yeah. What do you mean? Yeah. No, I'm gonna go to, no, you mean work? No, no. It's, I love it. I'm gonna go play. Right? Be a whole different thing. Right? And that'll give people something to think about. Mm, totally. Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And your it thoughts? Seems, yeah, it seems like we spend so much time. Like we're we're all clearly doing similar things. You know, we all want something to believe in. We all need to be fed. We all want to be loved and give our love to others. But we get divided on these little things that we feel like our story is the most righteous and real, mm -hmm. and it is to us. But that doesn't make anyone else's experience any less valid. Mm -hmm. And it also doesn't mean we have to agree with them per se either. But if we could just figure out a way to like appreciate and respect those differences and share and learn from people for, with different views, then I feel like we could, could start connecting the dots. But 
there's so much focus on diminishing the lore and stopping people from uh, figuring out their roots and reconnecting to them. But it doesn't have to be that way also. You know, it, it can seem pretty grim and dark if, if you look at it, but at the same time, there's a lot of opportunity for awesome things to happen. Absolutely. I love what you said there, Casey, because it just made me think of some of the things that I learned uh, in some of my coach training. And it was really pivotal for me. And I'll just, it was this one seminar and they were talking, they were teaching these things. It was a leadership program. And they said, you'll never influence anyone if you're judging them. Mm -hmm. And you'll never be influenced by anyone if they're judging you. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I'm like, light bulb just went off and I realized, oh my God, no wonder I wasn't having the influence. Even though I had these skills and these tools and everything, there were certain areas where I didn't have any influence, where I couldn't inspire someone into my way of thinking, which of course I thought was always for a better purpose, but um, I realized I was judging and they couldn't get me to do anything. And it was a work related thing and, and stuff this is what I was relating to because I was being judged as well. And, you know, this number one step that we use in strategic intervention for creating any change, working with anyone is to understand and appreciate the other person's world. You know, it doesn't mean we have to agree like Casey was saying, but we understand, we can appreciate where they're at and what's brought them into that, you know, place or, or challenge or whatever that might be. And, it was just a really powerful thing for me that when I started looking at people and being curious to understand what's going on versus this, you know, judgment, especially in the business world, because there's a lot of that when we're fighting for status and hierarchy and position, because we think that's what's important. You know, we judge people. And then I ask myself, where did I learn that? And I'm not going to tell you where I learned it, but I discovered that and it changed everything in my life. It just changed everything. Mm -hmm. Because now I look at people with a, you know, a, a curiosity with a wanting to understand where they're coming from so that I can, you know, not so much influence them, but, you know, I don't want to be judging them. I just want to be open and, and have that opportunity that if I can make a difference, it's not going to come from me thinking you're less than or you're wrong or you're not doing it right or whatever that is. So it was just something I wanted to share because it was a really, really powerful moment that changed my life just when it came down to, um, you know, what you were talking about there, Casey. And, and the other thing I wanted to share was because we've kind of talked about it and it brings back a little full circle in a way when we look at commercialism. And I don't know where I heard it, but I've, I've used it a few times and people go, wow, it really gets them thinking. We are the only animal on this planet that pays to live here, right? We have mm -hmm. to pay for our food. We have to pay for our rent. We got to pay for our house. And my grandmother always said, and I did not quite understand it at the time, but she said, there's no pockets in a shroud. You can't take it with you. Right. So here we are you know, doing all these things for what we think. And again, I believe we've been imprinted this way, Lori, in a way, um, you know, for 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 money and stuff. Yet in my dog, he doesn't pay to he doesn't pay to live here. Right. I pay for him to live here. <laughs> you know, if you look at nature, the hummingbirds fly, you know, it all happens naturally. Yet we're living in this weird construct. And with COVID happening and all these things, the economy changing, they're talking about a cashless society. I think it's a really great time to start growing your own food and understand what's out there because it's another way of bartering. Mm -hmm. Well, if we should be paying to live here, we should pay the earth. We should thank the earth and uh, reap the abundance of what we sow. You know, mm -hmm. like we have such a scarce mindset. We think that there's, there's never enough, you know, we have to, we have to fight our way in. Okay, into... I'm not sure um, oh. Oh. if I'm we... the only one that's actually talking oh. because I can actually. I don't know what we got going on there. <laughs> and uh, got some feedback. Lori, is that uh, you? I think it is. Um, Let's see, Lori. We're all judging. We're judging, Sorry. you know, even when we say, oh, I really like that person. 
that's actually a judgment. So uh, for me, what I realized is I'm just her glasses or nice color shirt she had on or you don't. And and I've, I, that's what I love about aging. As we get older, as I get older, I realize how that's so not important in my life. Um, that there's so many other things that I want to put my time and energy into. And um, yeah, I think, you know, acceptance and diversity is a big part that I talk about, Casey, when I'm teaching the children is that, you know, we have a diversity in plants, animals, insects, birds, fish, you name it. But we also have the diversity in the human family. So, you know, that that's so important that we all remember where we come from, our stories, our language is instrumental to be able to pass mm -hmm. that on to our, our children. So, you know, we really need to celebrate um, this incredible, beautiful human family with all of the beautiful foods and medicines that we all have been caring for such a, such a long time. And just something I just want to quickly add, like here in on the West Coast, our artists um, are considered our shamans. And um, one of our shamans is um, Robert Davidson. He's a Haida artist who's been carving for and creating incredible art for the last 50 years. And recently there was a documentary um, produced on his work. And uh, I didn't know really why I was watching it. I mean, I'm always interested to hear of our, our beautiful um, first indigenous people of this land that I call my home. But here was the piece. It was at the very end when Robert um, shared with us that our modern day supernatural beings are the corporations. Mm. And then he asked the question, do you have the strength to resist them? And I was like, oh my goodness, thank you, Robert. I'm going to share that with every person that I meet because I really, what I, what I see as I'm aging is that I'm on my own hero's journey. <laughs> and the hero has got to, you know, fight off some of these, uh, you know, big, bad, evil, whatever, you know, name you want to context, you want to put that in. And recognizing, you know, uh, that, you know, if I was sitting on billions of dollars, the first thing I do is clean up the ocean. Mm. And nobody's doing that. And I, I'm so perplexed by that. So mm -hmm. my strength is by me growing my food, knowing my medicines, growing outside my door, eating, you know, um, as much locally as I can, supporting farmers, you know, making my own crafts and trading. You mentioned that, Casey, that's what we used to do. And I'd really love to see those trade routes that have been here for thousands of years from the south to the north. And, and that we move that food or those goods even slower. You know, we put them on trains or we put them on sailboats. We've got to get off our gas and oil, right? We've got to go to solar. We've got to, you know, we can do that. Think of all the big mm -hmm. corporations that would crash if we got rid of gas and oil. Jeez, come on. Yeah. <laughs> and they're already selling the their shares. Mark, they're already selling their shares, BP and Chevron and all kinds of, they're already starting to um, download well, and, on all of that. And look what happened when all this COVID started, when everybody stopped driving because everybody was quarantined and locked down, you know, oil prices were at a negative price. And, you know, if you, we go back in time, we look at Nikola Tesla and the things he invented and free energy, it's out there. And these are mm -hmm. the things that I always ask people to wake up to is kind of take a look what's running the world. And you mentioned uh, the social dilemma. Anybody watching this, if you haven't seen it yet, mm -hmm. go to Netflix, watch a social dilemma because it will blow your mind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're all on social media. And one of the things that really stuck with me out of that was if you're not selling something on social media or a, selling a product, then you are the product because they're selling advertising to sell to you and those algorithms, how they all do. So it's amazing just how they can track, you know, your interests, know what you like, because when you're talking about the corporations there, it's the data, it's the data and the information of all of us, of what we do, where we go, you know, Google tracks me on my phone, everywhere I go, 
you know, so they know your buying patterns. They know all of these things. And it was just a really, really, you know, I knew there was stuff to, going on there, but to the depth uh, that it was. And when you talked about resisting, you know, do you have the strength to resist the corporations? What I really loved was the people who stepped outside of these corporations with Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and Pinterest, mm -hmm. and they start spilling the beans, right? I'm surprised that's not censored. The thing that gets me is like, we're, we're not connected to any of the things we do anymore. Like we're not connected to our food. We're not connected to like the things we buy, we buy everything. So wouldn't it be nice to get a little bit of that back, you know, and save a few bucks and feel good about the process that we create. And it's so achievable. It's just, it's hard to come by if you don't actively search for it. It's not in the education systems. It's not on the news. So I think like you say, Lori, it's just about doing the best actions for ourselves and inspiring others through our own actions. Mm -hmm. Because handing out a pamphlet doesn't work. You know, we can't recruit people by, by conning them and telling them to come do the thing. It has to be a choice that they make within themselves. Yeah, it's how do we touch, move, and inspire people to make a difference? Mm -hmm. You know, I, another food for thought that I went off you know, when you were talking, Casey, because it just got me thinking about when you talk about social responsibility, we know plastic is bad. We know it's not good for the planet, right? Yet we still use it. We still package everything in it, and we overpackage everything, everything. Mm -hmm. Like, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be, um, such a great thing if something like the WHO, you know, if it's about world health, said every single thing that is packaged must be in a biodegradable, recyclable package with minimum space. Imagine you'd have a lot less landfill, like so many things would be different. Well, you know, here in Vancouver, there's a project called the Binners Project. Mm -hmm. And so they do education um, to, you know, to keep people strong and healthy and safe as these uh, men and women are spending their time jumping into bins or collecting everything that is... Um, has a di disposable amount to it, right? So your pop bottles, your beer bottles, you know, now yeah. we they've just recently done milk containers now. But it made me think quite a few years ago, I have to say this probably, wow, I was living in the West End, it might've even been 30 years ago, that I used to think about, you know, these, these men and women that were, you know, sometimes risking their lives jumping into those bins. And I had thought, wow, if we put a, a dollar value on every piece of garbage and that dollar had to go back to the company that created it, everything would change, I'm sure, in almost instantaneously. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you were getting rid of your microwave and somebody just threw it out on the, on the back you know, alley and I came along and binned it and picked it up, that I get $10 for it and it would have to come from Sony or Panasonic or whoever manufactured that. So you see, if we actually put a dollar value on our garbage, then we can really shift. And why And why not? Because guess who's going to pay for it anyways? It's going to be the consumer. You, were, you, yeah, you would most likely pay $10 yeah. for that mm -hmm. item. Mm -hmm. That's um, a brilliant idea. Brilliant. You know, I, I, I think that... Yeah, well, and, and this is the other thing, you know, when you talk about the binners, if you're one of the people who look at the binners and go, oh, because people are like that out there, I would ask you to consider the possibility of saying thank you because they're actually doing a whole lot of good for the planet, for recycling, for all of that, because all of that stuff, and these guys pick up a lot of stuff, they save a lot of you know, waste and re reusable waste from mm -hmm. the land. So I just want y'all to think about that. Next time you see someone doing that, say thank you. We put our, our stuff out in the back alley. Anything that's worth worth uh, money and cash, we put it out there for, for people to pick up. And we separate it for them. And that's just a, a bit of contribution that we do as, as well. So, yeah, I would say thank you to that.
So, hey, ladies, we're getting close to wrapping it up. We've got about five minutes left. Um, what I'd like you to do is, is share if anybody watching this out there interested in the work that uh, that you're doing, how to learn more about getting back to nature, looking at plants for healing, sustenance, um, you know, in all sorts of healing, because we didn't even talk about plant medicines except cannabis. Mm -hmm. you know, let people know how they can get a hold of you and find more about the work you do, ladies. Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, I have a podcast and it's available on Spotify and Anchor and it's called The Consciousness Continuum. It's great. And thanks. Yeah, I'm also gonna be trying to organize uh, an event next year on centralizing around like trauma and addiction and whatnot. So yeah, I think Mark's gonna collaborate on that with me. And yeah, you're not gonna try, excited. you're gonna do it and I'm gonna help you. I'm gonna be, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> it's gonna happen. For yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Sweet. Sweet. Um, well, you can find me at lauriesnyder.co. And um, I'm on Facebook. So you can always message me that way. And I'm always open to, you know, do workshops, whether that's identifying wild native and medicinal plants up here in the Pacific Northwest or here on the coast, in the Coast Salish territories. Um, I also do workshops on how to, you know, make some of the medicines and that might be like apple cider vinegar tinctures or salves, flower essences, incense. And um, yeah, and my, my, my good friend, Laura Cisneros and I, we've uh, actually started to do some nature walks. Mm -hmm. And what we're, what we're working on is witnessing these changes and like a low tide or a high tide or watching the sun come up or doing a full moon contemplation. And then we have some conversations around cannabis. We invite people to share and partic participate and have some. And, you know, what are your stories? What are your perceptions with her that you can recognize her as a plant spirit medicine, as a helper, as a teacher, as a, uh, you know, a co-creator? in your healing and in your creativity. So yeah, there's a few places you can find me and, and see what I'm up to. Great. Well, ladies, thank you so much for, for joining me this evening. It's always a pleasure to have, you know, these conscious conversations around, you know, some really simple action really that can change our life, change our health and literally change the world. So if you were to have as we sign off, if you had like one little wish for the world, something that you really wanted to share, what would that be? Hmm. Um, I would have to say just slow down and recognize that we don't know everything and that's not as bad as it seems. Like listening can be, can be quite insightful and nice sometimes. So yeah, just listening to nature more. Thank you, Casey. Oh, so beautiful. And um, what I would just remind everyone is that we all bring our uniqueness to the circle, to the, the community, to unity. And, you know, for us just to remember, you have something to contribute always. So, you know, each one of us make this um, a better place. And yeah, just be thinking about what are your contributions? Why are you here? So you can get on track and um, think about our children's children. And just really grateful to have an opportunity to, to share. So thank you, Mark. And, and yeah, so thank you, Mark, very much. It's always a pleasure, ladies. I, I, I love working with, with each and every one of you when, when we do stuff, because I've, I've been invited to join Casey on her podcast on a few occasions and it's always just a pleasure and an honor. I thank you for that, Casey and Lori. I know we've done some work together and we still will be and we've journeyed together and we've had many great conversations and, and I really respect and appreciate your work as well. And I just want people really be your true authentic self. Wake up to the power that is you because we can do anything. We can do more than we ever thought we could imagine and we need to use our voice, we need to use our body, we need to, you know, release our spirit so that, you know, we can create this contagion for good, for health, for spirit, 
that will change the world in a positive way. And, and that's what I like to see. So I thank you ladies for being part of that mission and that part of that vision, sharing your gifts with the world. And I thank PMC Global, Conscious Living Network, and everybody who's watching Blissed Out Network. You know, a lot of, we've got a lot of supporters who are sharing this as well. So I thank them for, for the support and the work that we do. And until next time, my name is Mark Caron. I thank my guests, Case McFarland and Laurie Schneider. And this has been your wake up call. You might not be able to sleep tonight. Thanks. Take care. Till next week.